friends, welcome back to the Ransom Tart Podcast. John Eldridge here with you again this week in episode six, the second to our last episode in our spiritual warfare series. I really hope this has been helpful to you. I think today is going to be super helpful as well. And this week, Alan Arnold is joining me in the studio. I appreciate you coming in today to absolutely to be with me in this conversation. You know, as we've been saying through this series, we are a group of people who are seeking life. We're, we are seeking a deeper life in God. We are seeking wholeness, restoration. Yes. We're seeking all of the riches of the kingdom that we can possibly lay hold of on this side of things. And Jesus warns us that there is a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? Mm -hmm. And he says that before he says, but I really do want life for you, right? Right. So what we're really trying to do in this series is actually just lift up Jesus Christ, lift up his work, lift up and exalt all that he has done for us. Let me read again from Colossians chapter 2. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our debts which stood against us and condemned us, He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The victory of Jesus Christ does so many things. Yes, it atones for our sins. Yes, it ransoms us from the kingdom of darkness. Here, it makes it very clear that it cancels all of the claims against us, mm -hmm. and it disarms these various ranks of foul spirits. It disarms the rulers and authorities by the power of the cross. So as we move into this week's conversation, we just want to lift up Christ, lift up what he's done for us, because we're going in a new direction this week. We've been talking about foul spirits. We've been talking about soul ties. This week, we want to talk about blessing and cursing. We want to talk about the power of curses, judgments, hatred, envy, and how to disarm it, how the cross of Christ and all that God has provided disarms it. But let me start with a story. Back in the 90s, I was in my young 30s, and I had this experience twice. I was sitting in my cubicle at the large company I was working for at the time, and suddenly I began to have heart pains. And then those heart pains began to go down my left arm and radiate into my left hand. And I'm like, whoa, yikes, these are the indications of a heart attack. Right. Holy cow. And so I was very new in a lot of this material. I didn't really know what to pray, but, whoa, Father, Jesus, be with me. What's going on? Pray for your help, God. And it actually continued to get worse. So bad, in fact, that I went over to a colleague of mine and said, I need you to drive me to the emergency. I think I'm having a heart attack. I didn't want to call Stace. I didn't want to trigger a whole avalanche mm -hmm. of panic over something that might not be true. Right. Right. Could have been the oysters I had for lunch, <laughs> but took me to the hospital. And, you know, as soon as you walk in an emergency and you say, I'm having heart pains and it's radiating down my left arm. I mean, boom, they are on you and you are in a wheelchair and you are back. And it's, you know, all the tests that they do, the EKGs and, and all of that. I was there for a couple of hours. And after a battery of tests, they came back in and they said, you know, Mr. Eldridge, we don't, I don't really know what to say to you, but you're fine. And I'm wow. like, oh, that's great. That's great. I, I'm great with that news. You know, we don't know how to explain to you the pain that you're having, but if it comes back, if it continues, obviously, please come back to the ER, but all of our tests show that you're fine. So with that, I went home and by the evening it subsided. And, and then about six months later, maybe less, it happened again. 
And this time it was fierce. And I actually went back to the same colleague who was at work again. And I said, hey, man, it's happening again. We got to go to the ER now. Boom, in the door, in the wheelchair, rushed into the back. And this time they actually kept me overnight. They wanted to do, you know, the stress tests and all that stuff. And once again, after blood work and x-rays and a whole, you know, they really kind of did the full palette because I was, mm -hmm. you know, I was returning. Yeah. Nothing. Nada. Nothing. I was fine. And they're like, actually, you know, Mr. Aldridge, for men who come in here, your heart is actually in phenomenal condition. You're as fit as a fiddle. And so I left, thanking God that I wasn't having a heart attack, but also puzzled over this. And I went to get some prayer. I knew enough to say, you know what, this is really suspicious. If there isn't a medical explanation, you know, in the physical world, well, then let's look at the unseen world. And so went to get some prayer from some folks, and the gentleman happened to have a little bit of experience in this field, and we were praying, and he said, did you know that there's a curse on your heart? And I said, no, what's that? And he's like, well, have you ever had any problem with your heart? And I'm like, well, yeah, I thought I was dying twice. And he's <laughs> like, oh, yeah, that's it. He said, yeah, this is a curse that's been placed on your heart, wow. and we can break that through the power of the cross because the cross handles things like this. And so we prayed together and he prayed and his wife prayed and Stacy prayed and broke this curse over my heart. And I have never had those symptoms again. Never. Never. So for which wow. I praise God, wow. right? right? I'm grateful for that. And friends, the Bible actually takes the world of blessing and cursing very seriously. It is a, an assumed reality in both the Old and the New Testament. And when Jesus says, bless those who curse you, bless and curse not, he doesn't say, oh, there's nothing to that. <laughs> you know, those curses, that's just a silly thing. Just ignore it. He's right. like, no, no, there's, there's a reality here, and I want to teach you how to disarm it. So let's go back, as we've been trying to do in the scriptures, and ground these things in our biblical worldview. I want to go back into Genesis chapter 12. This is the beginning of the narrative of the redemption story. You know, you've had the fall of man, you've had Cain and Abel, you know, you've had the Tower of Babel, all of that in Genesis. And now we're going to get the story of Abram. And we're going to get the emerging redemptive plan of God through the people of Israel, which will culminate in Jesus Christ. And here's what God says. He says, Genesis chapter 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make your name great so that you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. And, he, you know, here, right away in the beginning of the you know, kind of the serious narrative trajectory, which is going to result in the nation of Israel and the coming of the Messiah, God himself is taking blessing and cursing very seriously. Right. Right? Again, he doesn't ignore the cursing side. He doesn't say, oh, and if anyone curses you, no big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, shake mm -hmm. it off. It's not a real thing. He says, no, it's a very serious thing. And in fact, if anybody does that, I myself will curse them. Yeah. Just you saying this, John, like on the topic of blessings, we hear that all the time. We ask for people's blessing. The pastor of our church or some elder blesses us. I'm really used to that, but cursing, that just doesn't tend to be an everyday category for me of thinking, right, if people have the power to bless you, and biblically that's addressed. Yes. But there's also these things called curses that are happening. And what would you say to listeners who, when they think about the category of cursing, everybody's probably thinking, yes. oh my gosh, I've got a curse on me yeah. right now. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Alan, for that. Because Jesus, even now, we, we reject that. 
We're, we're not going to trigger an avalanche of worry, <laughs> right. anxiety, panic. Come into our explanation today, Jesus. Come into our discussion. Come into the scriptures. And right now we reject fear mm-hmm. and grasping and speculation. We're not going to go on literally a witch hunt. Lord, we're just going to say, Jesus, come and teach us about these things. Uh, Ground us in the scriptures. Show us the reality and then show us how it applies to our lives. That's good. So let me try and unpack the category and and then we can talk a little bit about how you do identify these, how you know when they're operating, and more importantly, how you break them. So, you know, when you're dealing with foul spirits, you're dealing with living beings. These are fallen angels who have a mind, and they have a will, and they have reason, and they have understanding. However distorted it may be, still, you know, when the demons encounter Christ, they know who he is, and they shudder, right? Mm -hmm. And as we were talking about in soul ties, we're dealing with people, again, personalities with a will and, and with brokenness who project themselves in unhealthy ways to us. But this is a different category. Alan, just as there are laws to the physical universe, there are laws to the spiritual universe. So in the physical world, God created a a world that has laws to it, right? So you have a law of gravity. Drop that basketball, it's gonna it's gonna drop. Fall out a second story window, you're gonna get hurt. You know, nobody floats, everybody (laughs) drops, Mm -hmm. and everything drops. You know, there are there's the second law of thermodynamics, there's the law of entropy. There are these naturally governing laws to the physical world that God created. And thank God for it, by the way, because you couldn't build a house, you couldn't drive a car, you couldn't even get home safely. If we didn't understand that there were principles and structures built into the natural world Mm -hmm. that allow us to operate in it. So just as that's true of the physical world, it's actually true of the spiritual world. Paul says in Romans 8, 1, as he is announcing this tremendous victory that's been won for us in Christ, he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So the scripture acknowledges that there are these operating principles. In fact, back in the redemption story, God had warned that the soul that sins will surely die. And so sin enters the world through Adam, death through sin, and that's got to be undone somehow. So he's got to come in. Remember in Narnia, Aslan, and what he did on the stone table, he said this is a deeper magic. Right. Yes. Okay. So there are these governing realities. And you have, for example, the law of generosity that seems to run through Scripture. There's these verses that tell us, give and it shall be given unto you. I will bless those who are generous, the Lord says. My God will supply all of your needs through his riches in Christ Jesus. And that verse is given in the context to a giving church. There were generous people, right? Mm -hmm, right. So you have that one. Right. And there seems to also be a general law of forgiveness, where if you withhold forgiveness, then it seems like when you need forgiveness, it could be withheld from you as well. Right, right. And again, I I don't want to get us lost in the weeds here, but you do have that principle, right? Forgive those as you would have God forgive you, right? Let me read from Galatians 3 now. Paul is talking about a kind of curse that's also woven into the fabric of the world. And he says, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God, Paul says, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Listen, by becoming a curse for us. For it is written... Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. 
So here, you know, there's just this assumption in the biblical authors that just as there are natural laws, there are spiritual laws, and the laws of blessing and cursing are taken very, very seriously, and they're woven very deeply into the redemption story and into the victory won for us in Jesus Christ. And so what I want to say is, as we seek to live into our restoration and as we seek to spread the gospel, this incredibly good news of restoration available to us in Jesus, we're going to encounter different types of opposition that we will have to deal with. And we've been talking about, you know, the attack of the enemy and foul Mm -hmm. spirits. We've been talking about soul ties with people and how their warfare can jump on you. But there's this other category of things we're going to run into that I would describe as curses, judgments, hatred, and envy. And again, God has provided everything we need. I was reading an article in Newsweek, April 22nd, 2019, which was talking about the explosion of witchcraft in the United States. And to read from the article, it says, witchcraft and other pagan religious practices increased in the U.S. over the past few decades, with millennials in particular turning to astrology and tarot cards as they turn away from Christianity and other traditional religions. The number of witches and Americans practicing Wicca religious rituals increased dramatically since the 1990s, with several recent studies indicating that there may be at least 1.5 million witches across the country. The increase has been led by a rejection of mainstream Christianity, a young young Americans, as well as a rise in occultism. With 1.5 million potential practicing witches across the U.S., witchcraft has more followers than the 1.4 million mainline members of the Presbyterian Church. That blows me away. Right? Wow. So, gang, we, we are in the midst of, and have been now for about 25 years, we are in the midst of a pagan revival. People are walking away from traditional faith and maybe their family faith experiences and dabbling in and these other types of religious practices, shamanism and witchcraft and Wicca and, and that sort of thing. And it's really very sad. And the scriptures talk about Satan moving people to do his work. You know, clearly, in the redemptive story, you have Pharaoh, right, who first killed all of the Israelite babies, all of the boys, and that's why Moses is such a remarkable story that his parents hid him. And then later in the Pharaoh story, he comes against Israel and tries to destroy the people as they flee the country, that the enemy will use human beings to try and do some of his work in the world. And he's deceiving these people. Right. And do you remember, it was, I think it was during the Kavanaugh hearings when Justice Kavanaugh was in his hearings for the the Supreme Court vacancy, Mm -hmm. there was this huge public story about the witches that were gathering to curse him. Right. Right? Right. And so this is serious stuff and it's quite public now. Again, back to a couple stories. So, Years and years ago, I'm trying to think when this was. This was probably around 1993. Brent and I had not published The Sacred Romance yet, but we were teaching on it, and we were building the message, and some friends invited us to Puerto Rico to go down and give a basically a Sacred Romance conference Mm -hmm. in Puerto Rico. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night with unbelievable stabbing abdominal pain. And it felt dark. I could feel the darkness in the room. And again, at the time, I didn't have the categories of really of witchcraft. I mean, I'd heard of it. So I just started praying, Jesus, deliver me, Jesus, rescue me. And, And after several hours, it abated enough that I could go on with the conference, but it wasn't exactly like a full victory for several weeks. And what I didn't understand was that in places like Puerto Rico at the time, witchcraft is just rampant. I mean, it's just de rigueur. It's yeah, You know, it's kind of on every street corner. You can get somebody to slit a chicken and curse somebody for you. And <sighs> and so I was under cursing. I was under witchcraft. I just didn't know it. Years later, uh, the Ransomed Heart team, you remember going to South Africa? You remember how I gnarly? I totally remember. Yes. That was? 
we still refer back to it as one of the benchmarks in the team when we're trying to relate the significance of spiritual warfare on a current project. We'll go, yeah, it's almost like South Africa. And of course, you have enormous amounts of shamanism, voodoo, right? you know, occultism going on there. And I had similar physical affliction experiences. And, and we knew at the time, we actually saw the witches doing it. They were on the property. Right. Well, John, just to show how practical this is and how invasive it is, when Kelly and I first got married, we were in a rental home and the home next to us had a couple and they moved out. It was another rental home. And the couple and that moved in came over, introduced themselves and just said, and, and by the way, we're Wiccan and we're very friendly, very polite. But once a month, they would have a gathering where 50 or so cars would park out in the street. Yikes. And they built a fence. It was like five feet and they built one that was eight feet. But you could hear them gather in the backyard and there was a kettle and there was smoke and there was chanting. And I mean, this is this is our next door neighbor. This is this is a regular suburban neighborhood. A totally regular suburban in neighborhood. In middle America. In middle America. And what made it a little more tricky was uh, they were both police officers of the city. And so, so you if something call went the cops. wrong, you weren't going to call the cops. <laughs> and so I would just be in my backyard mowing the yard and she'd get on a little ladder and pop her head over the fence once a month and say, hey, Alan, just letting you know we're having our gathering tonight if you hear some noise and hear some things. And I was like, whoa, Kelly, bring the dog in <laughs> because I don't know what's smoking in the kettle. But it was bizarre and it was unnerving. And yet it was every day, an and, everyday occurrence. And unfortunately, it's more than that. It's more than bizarre and unnerving. The enemy will move these people to perform actual curses on you, and particularly against Christians. And it might be against the Christians in this city, mm -hmm. kind of general curses, or it may be cursing a specific church that's doing remarkable evangelistic work. Or oftentimes these folks don't know fully what they're doing, but the enemy and the demons involved will move them to do this. Yes. And again, before we start freaking out here, I just, I want to declare the power of the victory of Christ against this. Back in Ezekiel 13, it says, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I am against your magic charms with which you ensnare people like birds, and I will tear them from your arms. I will set free the people that you ensnare, I will tear off your veils and save my people from your hands, and they will no longer fall prey to your power. He's rebuking the mm. pagan witches. He says, mm. then you will know that I am the Lord, because you disheartened the righteous with your lies when I had brought them no grief, and because you encouraged the wicked not to turn from their evil ways and so save their lives, therefore you will no longer see false visions or practice divination. I will save my people from your hands, and then you will know that I am the Lord. And actually, this is a rebuke to women at the time in the people of Israel who had turned to these other practices. And you see it going on all through the Old Testament, even up to the point of human sacrifice. Isaiah fifty four seventeen is another one of our favorite verses when we're dealing with this stuff. It says, no weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. So I just want to announce that over this conversation to just continue to direct this towards the light and towards the truth and not into darkness. So coming back to the heart attack uh, episodes I was having and going to some people who had a little bit more experience in this than us and asking them to pray for us. What we did was actually very simple. We simply brought the victory of Christ directly against curses. And, you know, Jesus says, bless those who curse you. So we mm -hmm. begin by blessing. Lord, we bless whoever it is that's done this. Uh, we don't rage against them. We don't curse them in return. And that, in fact, is a very disarming step in itself. 
Forgiveness and love is a very disarming step against evil. Yeah. So we bless those who curse us, and then we bring the victory of Jesus Christ against the curses. Because as Galatians 3, we read earlier, it says, Christ redeemed us by becoming a curse for us. So bringing the cross of Christ, bringing the blood of Jesus against all forms of cursing disarms the power of these things in the spiritual realms. Now, I want to expand our conversation today because this doesn't just apply to actual voodoo being performed against you or shamanism or various kinds of occultism directly being performed against you because this principle, this law that blessing and cursing works extends out to what I would call more general things in the category of general cursing or judgments or hatred. Do you remember Morgan used to always get sick Mm -hmm. at retreats? Right. And it's a story that he's told on the podcast before, so I'm not outing him on this. But remember we were up at Crooked Creek one camp and he asked for prayer and we went and gathered. He's like, I'm getting sick again. I hate this. Like, you know, before every mission, before everything, it was very disheartening to him. And he's a guy who, you know, exercises, takes care of his health. So we gathered around, just the team, and we're praying for him, praying for his body, praying for his health, praying against uh, whatever the physical thing is. And I could tell, I just kind of could sense from Jesus, this line of approach was not going to work. And there were, you know, everybody was loving and praying and intervening. Remember that? I totally stop the conversation. I said, guys, I'm so sorry to interrupt the prayer, but here's what I'm here's what I'm hearing from Jesus. Jesus wants me to ask you a question, Morgan. And the question was, how do you feel about your body? And you could have heard a pin drop. Remember what he said? He said, I hate my body. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, what? You hate your body? He's like, oh yeah, I hate my body. I've hated my body for years. And I'm like, so you understand that no amount of prayer <laughs> on our mm. part is going to be able mm. to help you right now while you are cursing your own body, right? right. And so we had wow. this beautiful time of prayer where Jesus, intervening for Morgan, invited him to break the agreements he've, he'd made with hating and judging and even cursing his own body. And having done that, I mean, broken those, then we were able to usher in the goodness and the love and the and the restoration and the physical mm-hmm. life. And mm-hmm. so, was that from witchcraft? No, that was actually from Morgan in this general category of blessing and cursing. He wasn't blessing his body, he was hating it, judging it, cursing it, and he kept getting sick. So, little footnote there, be careful that you don't curse yourself, dear ones. I was meeting with a beautiful man several weeks ago, just to listen to his story, just to kind of swap stories and shed some light on each other's stories. And one of the things that he was struggling with was in the whole realm of career and career success and particularly financial difficulties and financial success. And he went back into his story. He knew enough to tell me some pretty important things. And so we went back into his childhood. He was raised in destitution. And I think when he was something like eight years old, his father called him in and said, I'm not going to be able to provide for you. So you'll have a roof over your head and some food on the table. But if you want anything else, if you want, you know, shoes or clothing or anything, you're going to have to provide for yourself Wow. to an eight-year-old boy. Mm. And the message from his dad was, you are not protected. You are not mm-hmm. cared for. You do not have a father who blesses you. You're on your own. And then I think a couple years later, he came in in a moment of just sincere need, and he he simply asked his dad if he could borrow a dollar. Borrow it. I mean, what 10-year-old boy can't go to his dad and ask him for a dollar? And and his his dad raged at him for it. And he immediately withdrew and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, even for asking. Now, what you had there, I said, well, tell me about your dad's childhood and his dad. And he said, oh, yeah, my dad was raised in destitution as well. And his dad was bankrupt and impoverished and passed on this legacy. And part of it is just a mindset. Part of it is just emotional. I'm not labeling everything as warfare. There's wounding. 
there's brokenness, but you also have generational sin, and you have something like this cursing that was being passed down from father to son of, I can't provide for you, you will never have enough, you're on your own. And it really ushered in this condition of impoverishment and destitution passed down through the family line. I don't like this principle. It breaks my heart that it's true, but throughout the Scripture, you do see the principle that the sins of the fathers being visited on subsequent generations, right? Mm -hmm. So you see, you know, one family struggling down through the line with adultery and another family struggling down through the line with alcoholism and another family struggling down through the line with violence. And I want to say you have more operating there than just emotions. Yeah. 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 Right. Or genetics, yeah. right? That they're, they're words that get spoken over us, words that end up being very defining, words that can feel like curses or judgments. And this is very, very common. The number of stories I've heard from people, words spoken over us by a teacher or a doctor or a coach, someone in, in authority over us, someone who we're looking to right. for counsel, direction, guidance and the doctor who says, oh, you'll never walk again. Or this Mm -hmm. kind of illness, people just don't recover from this. You need to just set a new normal and make arrangements because you're not going to get over this. Now, I I understand, I understand. This is nothing against the medical establishment. I love all of my doctor and nurse friends. My daughter's a nurse. I have benefited immensely from sober medical counsel. Mm-hmm. And you do want your doctor mm-hmm. to shoot straight with you and, and not, you know, hide the facts. But you need to be careful of the kind of words that get spoken over you. Yeah. You know, the coach that says, you'll never be an athlete, right? Yeah. You're just an uncoordinated kid. Find something else to be interested in. Or the teacher that says, you'll never be a musician. You can't even hold a note. Right. John, I remember my dad, he has since passed away, but he was in our home probably... um Oh, four or five years into our marriage. And Kelly and I and my father were sitting around late at night talking. And he just makes the comment, yeah, you know, Arnold men never make good husbands or just not good at marriage. What? And he didn't say it. Like it wasn't a dramatic moment. It, It was just a chat we were all having. And Kelly and I had brought up something about marriage And he wasn't saying it, it didn't feel like it was aimed at me. It was just a fact he was saying, pronouncing in the room. And I'm sure it had more to do with his own experience with a failed marriage and other things. But right, it was- There's two Arnold men in the room. Right. So who does this apply to? And it's in our home with my wife and I there. And so we knew enough then for me to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Dad, I don't agree with that at all. I break that, whatever yes. that is. And I just named that to say, um, sometimes it is the people who love you most that you hear these things from. And you have to be careful because if, if you're not aware of the category, you could just walk out of the that conversation going, wow, I guess that's true. Yes. And all of a sudden it goes from what's spoken into yes. what's carried out. Yes, it's passed on to you. Alan, the stories I've heard, the things people say on their deathbeds, like literally the classic story of, you know, you're going to ruin the family business in three years. And then the father dies. Wow. Those are his parting words to the daughter who, who just inherited the company or, you know, those kinds of things. Like, so folks, a heads up, blessing and cursing are real things. They have power behind them. They're, they're a kind of law or principle In the unseen realm, Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so to be aware of words that have been spoken over you, Mm -hmm. words spoken over a family line to say, oh, we will just never be successful or our marriages never succeed, right? Right. Absolutely. So you've got the category of like official cursing, and I would call that occultic practices, demonically inspired ritualistic type practices where actual curses like my heart curse were being performed or the things in Puerto Rico or in South Africa. But more commonly, 
and more pervasively, you have this other thing of like Morgan even cursing his own body. I hate my body and kind of repeating it over time. Well, his body just began to respond to that through illness and injury. And, and then you have words spoken over us by people in authority over us. And something I would add to this would be judgments. You know, you've been online, folks, good grief, the terrible things that are said online. I mean, the outright cursing that goes on in social media through so-called reviews, maybe, mm -hmm but people just blasting one another, cursing one another online. But you also see this lower grade thing that's just judgments, right? right. Of, oh, that's so stupid. Right. Or you don't know what you're doing. You're not good at that. They're, they're judgments passed over us. You're so arrogant. Right. You're so self-centered. You know, people posting or speaking or passing judgments on us, even and especially within the Christian community. And these judgments can be expressed. A church group can express judgment over, you know, some members who depart. And maybe they just needed a different church experience. Maybe there wasn't anything negative involved, but then the judgments get said, right? right. Oh, they're just not spiritual people. They don't really love the Lord. They're not serious about their faith. But the problem is part of like the energy behind it, right? It's not loving. And John, when you say judgments, can that also include things like offense and envy? It can be motivated by offense and envy. Okay. In, in other words, that's the energy. Okay. And then they speak these things or post these things Good. over you. Good. And you don't need to be within hearing for this to, it weighs you down. It weighs mm -hmm. the human spirit down to live under judgment. I would call these negative words low-grade curses, right? You know, they didn't sacrifice something. They didn't perform a ritual. Right. They didn't have the chanting and that, you know, I'm not going to go into those practices, but it wasn't official, intentional, demonic cursing. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. we learned from earlier in the series that sin opens the door for the enemy to oppress. And when people are sinning against you through cursing, judgments, hatred, it does open the door worthy thief to come and steal, kill, and destroy. Now, the beautiful thing is, is that all of this is disarmed by the cross. And all of this is disarmed in the same way, basically. Okay. So here is what I would do. When something fishy seems to be up, when, you know, you just can't seem to get breakthrough in an area that might be financial, it might be physical, when there seems to be a pattern of something going on mm. in a family line like violence or for me the physical affliction that just appeared out of nowhere there was absolutely no physical context for it it just boom suddenly i'm i'm in pain if you have a wonder gosh i wonder what this is we always begin by asking jesus mm -hmm. gang we've got a lot of tools in our toolbox and we have a lot of experience with this over the years. And when we get into our final episode, I'll talk about and try and address some of the questions around these things that get into more deeper matters. But we've been trying to keep this series applicable to a wide listening audience. What I want to say is even though we have years of history with this now and reading and studying and learning, when it comes time to pray, I don't assume it's good. I always stop and ask Jesus, Jesus, what is this? What's going on? Where is this coming mm -hmm. from? And that just drives us to Christ, which is defeating the purpose of the enemy. Like whatever else is going on, it's, it's pushing right. us into intimacy. And if you need the help of a friend praying with you, because, you know, maybe you're kind of caught up in the drama, get someone to pray with you and you just ask Jesus, Jesus, what is going on? What is happening here? And we'll always just start with the basic question, is this physical or is this spiritual? Yes. Lord, is this just financial or is this spiritual? Is this just a relational issue, Jesus, or is this spiritual? Meaning, shine your light on this, Lord. Help, help us understand. We don't want to just jump to conclusions. Yeah. And, well, about half the time, he'll say, yep, this one's spiritual. This is spiritual. John, that's been one of the biggest things you've taught me, which is just the phrase, let there be light. Because no matter what's going on, that's what we really need. We need God's light. 
So if it's physical, let there be light. If there's something spiritual, exactly. let there be light. Let there be light. It's such an easy thing to say that I think brings such great clarity. Yeah, we literally God. pray that, gang, is what Alan means. We, we will be in a time of prayer. We will pray, mm-hmm. let there be light. God, shine your light yes. on what's going on here. We don't pretend to fully understand. And even if we have some hunches, Lord, we, we want to walk with you. We want to grow. We want to be disciples. We want to learn from you, Jesus. So teach us, Lord, teach us. And it's also really good to first turn your attention to Christ. We're not, we're not focusing on darkness. We're focusing on the wonderful, fabulous reign of Jesus and all that he has accomplished through us and all that he has accomplished for us and in us through the cross, through the resurrection, and through his ascension. And so we'll stop and pray. And then if we do hear, yep, yeah, this one this one is a curse, or this is coming in from words spoken against you, or this is you're experiencing you know, the fruit of people's judgments against you. If we kind of hear the, this category, which is not a, it's not a demon, it's, it's the blessing-cursing reality, then we apply the work of Christ to it very specifically as we've been reading these scriptures. You know, we will quote Ezekiel 13, where God says, my people will no longer fall prey to your power, and then you will know that I am the Lord. You know, we'll pray Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon forged against us gets to prevail. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is their vindication from me. And most importantly, we will quote and pray Galatians 3, Christ became a curse for us in our place. And so we bring Jesus Christ crucified directly against us. Now, we bless those who curse us. We forgive it uh, because in doing that, it disarms it. And so if you know, I mean, I, I have childhood memories of things that people yelled at me, words that were spoken over me. And I, I go back and say, you know, I forgive that. I forgive you. And I actually pray blessing on you. Or if I have a sense that it is the Wiccans who live next door or or it is a cultic still, Lord, I send your love to these people. I send your blessing to these people. I forgive them. And that disarms it. And then we cancel the power of the cursing or the judgments or the hatred through the work of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We bring the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ directly against this curse of physical affliction or directly against this curse of financial suffering and poverty, or directly against this relational curse of right. isolation and this relationship always blowing up. Be as specific as you can, gang. General prayers see general answers, but specific prayers tend to see specific answers. And what I want to say is, before you try and kind of freak out and find everything and stuff, there, again, on our app, we've been We've been shouting out the app through the series, uh, the Ransomed Heart app. It's free. There's a section called SOS, which is the prayers section. Um, The daily prayer we've been recommending. And one of the reasons the daily prayer is so powerful is that it does, on on a regular basis, every day, you bring the victory of Jesus Christ against those things that are coming against you. And it's just really helpful. But there is also a prayer for breaking curses on the app and on our website under the prayer section you can find a very specific prayer so if you feel like this is you know something that's playing out in your life or after praying with a few friends you go wow this really does feel like witchcraft or this feels like this curse that was passed down there's a prayer for breaking curses that's a little bit more thorough Mm -hmm. and will guide you through that process but what i want to say is and we practice blessing We develop a culture of blessing, including blessing those people that we don't like very much, or blessing that church that betrayed us, Mm. or blessing the folks that we know on social media are outright judging us. We practice a culture of blessing, and we bring it home. It's not just in the spiritual warfare category to bring blessing into your homes. Yeah. Bring blessing into your families. Bring blessing into your work. Bring blessing into your lives. And one of the practices that we had as a family raising our boys growing up was every night there was prayer and blessings, and the boys loved it. And we would pray together, bedtime prayers, 
And then we would lay our hands on their foreheads or on their head, and Stacy or I, depending on kind of who was the parent at home that night, we would pray blessing on them. And we would, you know, repeat the famous blessing of Scripture, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And those blessings work, gang. They are a real spiritual force in the world. And I think I think the more that we enter into the category of loving, forgiving, and blessing, we'll actually find it easier to disarm the hatred, you know, judgments, and cursing. What I love about what you just said, John, too, is it takes away the fear of what's out there. In other words, if we approach it from intimacy with God, asking for light, blessing those who curse us, knowing how to bring the cross between us and them, rather than fearing what's out there or fearing a possible curse or judgment, it allows us, I think, to operate from a foundation of love yes. and life. Yes. And even in the middle of the night, gang, when you have the nightmare or you wake up to fear or foreboding or darkness in the room or whatever it may be, I always begin with Jesus. And I'll either just start saying his name, just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But for me, what I'm starting to do is worship. I'm starting to turn my heart towards him, and then I will, I will lift up Jesus Christ and start quoting some scriptures to begin with, right? That God our Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand, mm. far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, and every title that can be given. That was the Ephesians 1 passage we yeah. were using earlier in the series. Y'all just start quoting these things because my heart rises with it, my spirit rises with it. And what I'm doing is I'm not focusing on the darkness. I'm preparing my heart to deal with it. And then we've seen, right, resist the devil and he will flee from you, that there is an active participation on our part. And so then I'll, I bring the cross of Jesus Christ against this attack or whatever the particular prayer may be. And then once again, finish with, and I turn back to you, Jesus, restore me in you, Renew me in you, bring the kingdom of God over my sleep tonight, or I bring the love of God into this relationship, or I forgive those who are judging me. I bless, and I, I just return to the culture of love, to the kingdom of love, and invoking the kingdom into the situation. So, John, a quick question. For people who are hearing this and thinking, oh my gosh, I've actually unintentionally been judging or cursing, or my words have been bringing damage to people, what is the best first step for them? Okay, let fork in the road is if they know it or if they don't know it. If they know it, you go and ask forgiveness. If they don't know it, please don't go tell them. <laughs> that That's not necessary Good. to get this undone. Good. It's yeah. only going to damage the relationship because they don't know it, yes. all right? So if they know it, you need to go and apologize and ask forgiveness and say, instead, I really want to bless you. I forgive you. I love you. I bless you. If they don't know it, you do that in your prayer. You say, Father, I'm so sorry. I renounce my judgments. I renounce my cursing. I renounce my hatred. I renounce it, God. I bring the atonement of Christ over this because the atonement, the blood of Christ, disarms the power of the sin. Oh, Jesus, I plead your blood over this sin so that it won't bring harm on these mm -hmm. people. And then in your prayers, you know, this is driving down the street. You know, you you can do this any time of the day. I bless them, Jesus. Where I have been cursing, I bless. When I have been judging, I forgive and I bless, Lord. We cultivate a culture of love and a culture of blessing. Gang, we really hope this series has been helpful to you. This was episode six, our second to last installment in the series. And next week, we will try and address some common questions around the things that we've raised. We'll try and recommend some reading for further study. But in the meantime, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.